I'm going to introduce a man I have a great deal of respect for. His program, Ring of Fire, broadcasting Progressive Radio Nationwide. Let's give it up for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Thank you so much. Greg Cole, man, asked me to do this, and he is such an important figure in this country. You know, such an extraordinary American hero. Um, he... I, I wanted to come here, and the other, you know, and Randy Rhodes to be here with her. And she said, she is like... These are the exemplars, you know, the paradigms, the models of what uh, journalism and punditry should be about in this country, which is challenging authority and, and looking into the claims of government officials and being skeptical. And, that, and without that kind of uh, integrity in journalism, that kind of energy and that kind of mission, our democracy cannot survive. And that's what I kind of want to talk about tonight. Tonight I was, I was driving down here, I had to go to a talk at the this afternoon, late this afternoon, at the New York Public Library on a new book, the, uh, the reissuance of, of, of Barry Goldwater's 1955 classic, The Conscience of a Conservative, which I did the introduction to. The reason I did the introduction to it is because you read this thing and there's nothing in it that resembles the kind of conservatives that they have today. Um, it, this is not conservatism, but they have. It's a, it, they, pretend, they pretend to be conservatives, but they have torn the conserve out of conservatism. They, uh, you know, all of the things like uh, uh, free market capitalism, which they hate. You know, they want corporate crony capitalism, and and, uh, uh, and they want capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich, and uh, and they and and you know, and separation of church and state, which was one of the pillars of conservative protection of the Constitution, which uh, Goldwater considered, you know, was absolutely reverential about the Constitution. But these people have torn, destroyed the Constitution. We are now torturing people in this country. We are wiretapping our citizens. We are, uh, we are, we've suspended the 820-year-old right of habeas corpus. We've suspended our protections against search and seizure. And it's the biggest bunch of, of baloney when they say to us, oh, well, you know, we live in dangerous times. This is right. If you really look at it, and I have friends who died in the World Trade Center attack. My offices were destroyed in that, that attack. But objectively, we live in one of the safest times in the history of this planet, you know, for Americans. Because when I was a little boy, you know, and we had 15,000 nuclear-tipped warheads in Russia pointing at our country, each one able to destroy an entire city, that was dangerous times. But we didn't wiretap our citizens. We didn't torture people then. You know, we didn't suspend habeas corpus. We didn't uh, try to send people to Guantanamo or do extraordinary renditions to torture people in Syria. You know, during the Civil War, during the Civil War, you know, we lost entire cities. 640,000 Americans, not 3,000, 640,000 were killed. It's the equivalent of 6 million people being killed today. And Abraham Lincoln, said when, when they talked about torturing so Southerners or mistreating them, he, he drafted a document for how we treat prisoners and it later became the Geneva Convention because he said we are not going to do that as Americans. When George Washington was confronted with the British during the Revolutionary War, torturing American prisoners, keeping them on coffin ships right here in New York Harbor where they're dying by the score every day, Washington said we're not going to do that. If that's what we're going to do, then, then I'm not going to be part of this conflict. And he treated, he passed orders treating prisoners so well that when he captured Trenton, New Jersey, Trent, the, the barracks of Trenton, the Hessians were so astounded by the good treatment that they had received from the Americans that they walked all the way from New Jersey to Western Pennsylvania with no guards. Because of, and Dwight Eisenhower during World War II again said, no matter what the Nazis do, we are not going to torture them. And that's one of the reasons the Nazis gave up, the Germans gave up so quickly to us because they knew they were going to be treated well by Americans. All of these things are against the you know, conservative traditions that are part of our heritage and, and that, you know, that, that Barry Goldwater at his best celebrate. And I, so I was coming down to, to, uh, to do a, a, a talk at the, at the New York Public Library about this. And I, I was trying to think, you know, I had put that time aside driving from White Plains to here to think about what I was going to say. And I turned on Randy Rhodes, and she was she had the most fantastic show today, and I couldn't turn it off. Yeah. 
she, she was reciting all of these, you know, these ridiculous, absurd things that these journalists, um, the, you know, from Chris Matthews, and Joe Scarborough, and all of our great stellar journalists were saying when, you know, President Bush declared a mission accomplished and how they were all saying, well, now the Democrats have to apologize because they criticized the war. And, you know, Chris Matthews saying, we're all neocons now, right? Oh, anyway, I love you, Randy. I, every day when I go home from work, I look forward now to riding in my car because I listen to her every day and she is really an amazing hero. And you know, this is what we need. This is what we need to restore our democracy in this country because we need a press that is doing its job and it isn't. I mean, that is why, you know, we have the, the problem with the, the principal problem with democracy. There's two big failures. One is all the corporate money that's going into our election process. And the second failure is that we have a negligent and indolent press in this country that has simply let down American democracy. And you know, I travel all over the country and I hear people talking still, you know, people saying about talking about the liberal media. Well, that, there's, you know, that's, that's what Joseph Goebbels used to call the big lie. If you just keep saying it and saying it and saying it, people begin believing it. There's no liberal media in this country. You know, what do you have? You have The Nation's Magazine, you have a Mother Jones, you have Rolling Stone, you have Pacifica Radio, Air America, and then, you know, you have these two guys, and that's pretty much it. But we have a right-wing media in this country, and if you look around, that's where Americans are disproportionately getting their news. And, you know, the Pew Foundation recently did a survey that showed that 30 percent of Americans now say their primary news source is talk radio which is 90% controlled by the right. 22% said cable news, maybe Fox, mainly Fox News. 10% said Sinclair Network, which is the most right-wing of all of them. Sinclair is the, most, is the largest television network in our country. It's run by a former pornographer who requires all 75 of his local affiliate stations to take a pledge that they will not report critically about this president or about the war in Iraq or a number of other issues. And then the rest is only 11% of Americans now read papers where you still can get some relevant news occasionally, but the rest of us get our news primarily from the traditional corporate-owned media, ABC, NBC, CBS, and CNN, which have no ideology except for their own pocketbooks. And that ideology is almost always coterminous with the ideology of the party in power, but particularly the Republican Party, because, you know, they're, they're, they want all these consolidations, corporate, they're supporting these corporate consolidations. These are huge companies that have all kinds of subsidiaries that are looking for licensing deals and, and consolidation, you know, uh, concessions from the government, and they're not going to say something that offends them. And, you know, there's no, you look on, on, on network television, there's no liberal equivalent of John Stossel or Glenn Beck or Robert Novak or Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly or any of these other guys. You know, you have, okay, you've got Alan Combs, you know, and that's just... I, I gotta, I gotta read this thing to Randy read today. I mean, this guy is, you know, this is like that. That show is like, you know, it's the Harlem Globetrotters, and he plays the Washington, you know, generals. He's just his whole job is to lose every argument. And he says, here's what he said when when President Bush uh, declared mission accomplished a year ago today. Uh, now that the war in Iraq is all but over, should the, shouldn't the people in Hollywood who oppose the president admit they were wrong? That's from our great, you know, liberal voice on the American media. So, um, you know, and so, and when, what, what, this devolution of the American press began in 1988 when Ronald Reagan abolished the Fairness Doctrine. We had a rule, we had a rule in this country it was passed in 1928 at the dawn of commercial radio, and that was called the Fairness Doctrine. And that rule said that the airwaves belong to the public. The broadcasters can be licensed to use them, but only with the proviso that they use them to promote the public interest and to advance American democracy. There were three requirements under the Fairness Doctrine. Number one, they had to air issues of public import. That's why there's a six o'clock news hour on the networks. Not because they wanted it, they wanted to put entertainment in that slot. The news departments traditionally were, were, were uh, money losers. So they were forced to do that as part of the Fairness Doctrine. That's why the radio stations periodically update you on the news. It's part of the requirement under the original Fairness Doctrine that they're still you know, doing as, part, as a tradition. And number two, they had, if they were gonna give opinion, 
They had to tell both sides. You couldn't have had a Fox News under the Fairness Doctrine. You couldn't have had a Rush Limbaugh. You could have had Rush, you know, four hours a day, but then they would have had to put somebody else on a countervailing voice for the next four hours. You couldn't have Rush and his ditto heads for 24 hours a day on the same station. And Rush Limbaugh got started in 1988, the year that Reagan abolished the Fairness Doctrine. Number three, they had to avoid corporate consolidation. Congress wanted, and wanted to make sure that people in Kansas could get crop reports, that people in North Dakota could get tornado warnings, that people in the South could get country music, that you wouldn't have you know, programming and content dictated by a couple of corporate epicenters in remote areas of the country. And that part of the Fairness Doctrine, incidentally, was strengthened in 1945, was fortified, because they saw what Congress saw, what Hitler had done in Europe and the other fascist governments had done, where they had allowed these corporate consolidations and they had given these contracts and special favors to the media and they had co-opted the media and got them on their side. And, and so that anybody who criticized them was either muzzled or was branded as, you know, as, as unpatriotic. And they said, we can't allow that to happen in this country. So they strengthened that part of the fairness doctrine. Um, they, and and uh, today, Ronald Reagan abolished the Fairness Doctrine as a favor to the Christian right, which was already plotting the takeover of AM radio, and as a favor to the, uh, to the studio heads who had helped him get elected, who were plotting the takeover of all media. And today, as a result of that, there are five giant international or nat multinational corporations who control all 14,000, virtually all 14,000 radio stations in America, all 5,000 television stations, 80% of our newspapers, all of our billboards, and most of the large internet content providers. So there are five guys who are deciding what we hear is news and information. And the news departments have become corporate profit centers. They no longer have an obligation to promote the public interest. Their only obligation is to their shareholders. And they serve that obligation not by telling us the difficult issues that we need to understand, like, you know, what happens when you privatize Social Security and how did the pharmaceutical companies end up controlling Medicaid and Medicare and, you know, what is global warming um, and all of these issues, but rather by, by cutting costs and guess what? They, where do they cut costs? They, they cut costs by firing all of their investigative reporters. Eighty percent of investigative reporters have lost their jobs over the past 15 years. The people who could connect the dots between the money that came from the corporate polluters to the White House, then the rollbacks that were engineered by the White House, and the children that you see, the asthmatic kids that you see in New York City and all over this country. Um, uh, nobody's making those connections. Nobody's connecting the dots. So you see the asthmatic kid, and you're not saying the White House has something to do with that. The fact that in 19 states, you can no longer safely eat any freshwater fish caught in the state because of mercury contamination coming from coal burning power plants that were supposed to have removed 90% of that mercury five years ago, but the White House having accepted $48 million from that industry, rolled back the, uh, those rules. So that now there's, that there are 19 states, um, all of the freshwater fish are unsafe to eat. And in 49 states, um, most or some of the freshwater fish, including New York, which most of them are unsafe to eat. The only, a uh, state where all the freshwater fish are safe to eat is Wyoming, where the Republican-controlled legislature has refused to appropriate the money to test the fish. But in all the other states, <laughs> some or most, or all of them are unsafe to eat. According to CDC, one out of every six American women now has so much mercury in her womb, one out of every six, that her children are at risk for a grim inventory of diseases, autism, blindness, mental retardation, heart, liver, and kidney disease. My levels of mercury are two and a half times what EPA considers safe just from eating fish. And all of this could have been stopped except that, that, that uh, Bush abolished the mercury rule. But there's no, but Americans don't know that. I go and buy my fishing license for 30 bucks a year, every year in New York State, and I, I get the fish advisories, which are now this thick, that basically say there's only you know, a few places where you can safely fish in New York State. I read through that thing and I'm saying, that son of a bitch, George Bush. But most fishermen who buy that thing don't make the connection. The reason that they don't make the connection is because there's no investigative reporters out there telling them about that connection. Um, they also got rid of all the foreign news bureaus. When I was a kid, ABC had 47 foreign news bureaus in Europe. Now it has none. It buys its news in a can 
from, you know, the European producers. And that's why, you know, Americans, the only way that you can get foreign news in this country is if you go to BBC. And, you know, that's why Americans, we're supposed to be the leader of the free world, of the entire world. And yet, you know, we have no idea what's happening in other cultures or other countries. And that's why we, you know, the American people, you know, were able to be gulled into this neocon fantasy that we were going to be met by flowers and rose petals in the streets when we went into Iraq. And uh, because they have no obligation to promote the public interest, their only obligation is to their shareholders. They serve that obligation not by explaining the difficult issues that we need to understand to make rational decisions in a democracy, but rather by entertaining us, by appealing to the lowest common denominator, the prurient interests that all of us have in the reptilian core of our brains for sex and celebrity gossip. So they give us three weeks of Anna Nicole Smith, and they give us, you know, Lacey Peterson and Kobe Bryant and, you know, Michael Jackson and, you know, and Brad and Janet, Brad and Angelina, and we know more about Kate and Tom than we do about global warming. And um, American people are to today the best entertained and the least informed people in the face of the earth. And that has profound... <laughs> that has profound implications for our democracy because a democracy cannot function long if it does not, without an informed public. And you know, um, and I, I've known this for many, many years. I've, I've gone around the country. I do about 30 speeches a year in red states to Republican audiences. And I get the same reaction from Republican audiences that I do from liberal college kids. The only difference is the Republicans come up to me afterwards and say, you know, how come I never heard this before? And I'm like, you know, it's because you're getting your news from Rush Limbaugh and from, and from talk radio. And I came to this conclusion a long time ago that 80% that of Republicans are just Democrats who don't know what's going on. <laughs> and that, and you know, I, in, in, 2000, um, in, uh, in 2004, there was a survey done that Randy knows about and, and Greg, I'm sure, knows about called the Pippa Report. It was, it was done, it was a survey by the Public Policy Institute of the University of Maryland. It was a national survey that confirmed my own anecdotal observations that I've been harboring so, for so many years about this, about this phenomenon. Because you look on, you know, Sunday morning television and the, the pundits, we call them in my house, the Sunday morning gas bags, you know, we were talking about you know, the red, the morality difference, the red states have, a, have this, you know, have this monopoly on morality and the, the blue states are kind of dissolute and degenerate. What they found was just the opposite was true, that, you know, the, the lowest teen pregnancy rate was Massachusetts, the highest was Texas, the lowest divorce rate, Massachusetts, the highest Texas, the 10 lowest divorce rate states, all blue states, the 10 highest, all red, the 10 lowest teen pregnancy, all blue, the 10 highest, all red. A blue, a red state resident is more likely to murder you, to commit a violent crime against you, to, uh, to, to impregnate your teenage daughter, to watch Desperate Housewives on TV, to buy pornography, to play degenerate video games like Grand Theft Auto, etc., etc. So there was no, the, you know, this difference didn't exist. And what the, the Pippa report showed, Pippa went out and they quizzed people based upon their knowledge of current events and their party affiliation. And um, what they found was that there was not a values deficit, but there was a huge information deficit among people who voted Republican. They for, found, for example, 70% of the people who said that they were going to vote, that, that they were, had voted for George Bush, said that they believed that Saddam Hussein had bombed the World Trade Center. 70% believed that weapons of mass destruction had been found in Iraq. 65% said that they believed that the American invasion of Iraq was strongly supported on the Muslim street, among Iraq's Muslim neighbors, and by our traditional allies in Europe. 64% said that they believe that President Bush strongly supported the Kyoto Protocol and strong labor and environmental standards in our international treaty. Which, of course, all of that is wrong. Then Pippa went back two more times. The second time it went back to find out where the source of the misinformation was. And invariably, the people who had all this misinformation said that their primary news source was Fox News or talk radio. They went back a third time to determine what people's essential values were. And they asked a series of hypotheticals. For example, they said, what if there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? 
What if Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with bombing the World Trade Center? What if the American invasion of Iraq was mostly opposed on the Muslim street and among our traditional allies in Europe? Should we have still gone in? 84% of Democrats and 84% of Republicans said the same thing. We should not. So there was no difference in the values. The only difference was in the information. And that is why it is so critical to have a working press in our country. And you know, when I, I did a piece on the Fairness Doctrine, again for Vanity Fair a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, and I went back and looked at the debates that occurred um, when the Fairness Doctrine was passed almost unanimously by Republicans and Democrats in 1928. And it was, a, and they recalled the initial debates at the beginning of our country, where there was a, uh, there was a, 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 a division between Jefferson, who wanted a universal franchise, he wanted everybody to vote, and Hamilton Adams and Madison, who wanted to restrict the vote to landed gentry. Not because they were snobs, not because they were undemocratic, but they believed that the great mass of uninformed, uneducated public would not be forthright in fighting to retain their civil rights that these guys had laid down their lives and their fortunes for. They said, I'm only an educated public who has a long view will do that. And Jefferson said that, Jefferson agreed, and Jefferson himself said, an uninformed public will trade a, a hundred years of hard fought civil rights for a half an hour of welfare. You know, to the first uh, religious fanatic or demagogue or tyrant who comes along and, and promises them a $300 tax break. He didn't say that at the last part, but he said the first part. But that's what he was talking about. And he said the remedy for that is not to deprive the public of their rights, but rather to forcibly inform them, whether they want to be informed or not. And that's why the 13 colonies did something that nobody had done in history, which was to impose mandatory public education. So you would go to jail if you did not, if you did not attend school, you were punished for it. And, that's because, and you know, Jefferson in Virginia started all these educational institutes, the University of Virginia and, the, and other ones, to force people to, to, to understand current events and to understand philosophy and history and all these other things that we need to understand if we're going to retain our democracy. And you know, when the Fairness Doctrine came along, everybody said, hey, this is going to be the way that the public gets its information. We cannot afford to let this, this medium fall into the hands of a, of, a, of a handful of profit-making corporations who are going to use it to enhance their own position and to consolidate their power with government against the people and against our constitutional rights. And that's why they passed the Fairness Doctrine. Now, it was, it was, it was, it was eroded. Um, it was destroyed by, you know, Reagan and then Clinton also, you know, through the Telecommunications Act, get, you know, torpedoed it and sank it uh, completely. So, you know, and this corporate consolidation is happening now as, as Greg showed in his film here, you know, we are seeing the privatization of the American government. And we have a government now, you know, that, that turned FEMA over, you know, to somebody who paid them campaign contributions. And the head of the Forest Service is a timber industry lobbyist, Mark Ray, probably the more, most rapacious in history. The head of a public lands and mining industry lobbyist, Stephen Griles, who believes that public lands are unconstitutional. The head of the air division at EPA is a utility lobbyist, Jeffrey Homestead, who's represented nothing but the worst air polluters during his entire career. The head of Superfund is a woman whose last job was teaching corporate polluters how to evade Superfund. The second in command of EPA is a Monsanto lobbyist. The reason they shouldn't be running our government is because corporations don't want the same thing for America as Americans want. But they, corporations do not want free markets and they do not want democracy. They want profits. And the best way for them to get profits too often is to use our campaign finance system, which is just a system of legalized bribery, to get their hooks into a public official, then use that public official to dismantle the marketplace, to give them monopoly control, and then to privatize the commons, to turn over our treasury, our air, our water, our public lands, our wildlife, our fisheries, the shared resource of our society that give context to our communities, that connect us to our past, and that are a source of our values and our virtues and our character as a people, and to turn those over for profit to these corporations. And, um, and you know, when corporations, we have to remember this, legally cannot do good things. They cannot do true philanthropy. They can't do things that are good for our country or for our communities. When you see, you know, Walmart bringing bottled water down to the Katrina victims, they're not doing that to be good guys. They're doing it because they think that over the long run, 
that the public view of them will be enhanced and that that will enhance their shareholder value and their dividend distribution. If they have another reason for doing it, any one of their shareholders can sue them and they will win that lawsuit. It is called wasting corporate assets. It is against the law in this country for a corporation to turn itself into a philanthropy. And if they're caught doing it, their, their, their uh, board members will be punished and they, their shareholders can sue them. And there's, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong. We, we want corporations to, to be this way, to focus narrowly. We don't want them to turn into philanthropies because nobody would invest in them. We want them to focus narrowly on shareholder value. But we would be nuts to let them anywhere near our government because we design them we design them to plunder. And that's what they're gonna to do to us if we let them run our country. And that's what they're doing now. And that's why, from the beginning of our national history, our greatest political leaders, Republicans and Democrats, have been warning Americans against the domination of corporate power. Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, said that America would never be destroyed by a foreign enemy, by an Osama bin Laden, but he warned that our Bill of Rights, our Constitution, and our treasured democratic institutions would be subverted by malefactors of great wealth who would steal them from within. Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican in his most famous speech ever, warned Americans against the domination by the military industrial complex. Abraham Lincoln, the greatest Republican in history, said during the height of the Civil War in 1863, I have the South in front of me and I have the bankers behind me. And for my country, I fear the bankers more. And Franklin Roosevelt during World War II said that the domination of government by corporate power is, quote, the essence of fascism. And Benito Mussolini, <laughs> Benito Mussolini, who had an insider's view of that process, said essentially the same thing. He complained that fascism should not be called fascism. It should be called corporatism because it was the merger of state and corporate power. And what we have to understand in this country is that the domination of business by government is called communism. And the domination of government by business is called fascism. And what we need to do, what our job is, is to walk that narrow trail in between, which is free market capitalism and democracy, and hold big government at bay with our right hand and big business at bay with our left. And in order to do that, we need an informed public that is able to recognize all the milestones of tyranny. And we need an aggressive and independent press that is willing to stand up and speak truth to power. And we no longer have that in the United States of America. Thank you all very much. Um, by the way, uh, for those of you um, out there in Radio Land who just missed Bobby Kennedy's presentation, he will be repeating it shortly at the Pacifica Air America Wing in Guantanamo next week. Ready Brooklyn Roundhouse, where we turn the train around. Ooh, it's Freddy Brooklyn Roundhouse. Then that train back out of sound. It's the train of eminent domain. It must turn around and move out of our Brooklyn town. For it dies to be replaced with high rise With a stadium scam nobody knows Seventeen skyscrapers are behind our stadium Freddy's Brooklyn Roundhouse Where we turn that train around